how much data we I just realized I hadn't hit record. Can you say all that again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a guy that used to be hanging around here when I was a kid, and uh, I went off and I'm working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and uh, helping build spacecraft. Um, I think I think eight, ten years ago, I came by and gave a brief talk about Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is still up in orbit. Yeah. And it has my name spalled on the inside of it. <laughs> right there, so they um, and uh, between then and now, I actually yeah. went to Japan for five months as we built the Global Precipitation Monitoring Spacecraft. And uh, I got to, to hang out there. They got a different word for everything in that country. Um, and uh, I got to get there, and I was on the launch team for that mission. Too. Well, I was within 700 meters of the launch pad. Wow. Oh, wow. Those are different in that country. Oh, yeah. yeah very good. That's cool. Thank you very much. This is my awesome. Nice day. Yeah. Sorry, All because of this place. Yeah. Right. But what? Um, what is your background? You guys can get there too if you want. <laughs> just, just for the person that just graduated, doing a degree, <laughs> do <laughs> work, research, yeah, be awesome. Sure. All right. Um, any so, other new business? Rob, it was Bob. Can I ask you? Am I on? There you go. Oh, yeah, I, I guess, guess I'm uh, getting the 2022 yeah. dues uh, collection period. Uh, so uh, we have about. Uh, uh, over 60 uh, people have already renewed. I want to thank all those people that have renewed their dues uh, um, for, for, for renewing. It's important, you know, for the to support the club. Uh, the dues remain thirty dollars for, for next year. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, if you haven't paid the dues yet, uh, I for the next year I you should have gotten an email from me today. Uh, with, gives, gives you four ways to to renew. Um, you can a couple of different ways with PayPal. Um, you can mail it to me, to, uh, or, or you can pay me here at a meeting or, or any of the four Tuesday workshop meetings. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can pay your dues if uh, uh, if, you want, if you're interested in joining. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Very good. All right, um, Bill, do you want to speak really quickly about the AP Sig meeting? Sure. So uh, this coming Saturday yeah, is really? the next you know, uh, is the when, uh, November oh, APC. That sound? Yeah. He's not muted, but can you fix uh, are, are you not getting cable, sound? Rob, make sure it's seated. Hello? Test, audio test. Okay. Yeah. Okay, starting yeah. after. Good. Okay, so this coming Saturday is the November AP SIG meeting. The uh, announcement will go out over the uh, dasgroups.io uh, mailing list, as well as to APSIG members directly. Um, don't have a special topic yet, but uh, it'll be Saturday, probably 7.30 p.m. That's right. it. Very good. And uh, just real quick, the book club said they're not having a meeting this month because Paul Hapburn is going to be speaking to us this evening, and they're considering that the book club meeting. Oh, and uh, Bill McKibben has a little thing he'd like to bring up. Uh, just one brief thing I wanted to bring up. Uh, most of you are probably aware of this, but for those who are, a great resource online is skymaps.com. They publish a monthly uh, a monthly chart that you can conveniently you know, look north, south, east, west. Uh, it usually has uh, you know two dozen objects that are prominent for the month. Uh, it's free cheap and easy, and uh, especially for people that are borrowing some of the loaner dots that are you know, just getting started, it's a great resource. I'm gonna leave a handful of these up here if anybody wants to grab one, and uh, I'll try to put something in focus, website or both, and uh, make sure everybody knows about it if you haven't already heard. Very nice. All right. And just another quick announcement, real quick. We have been making a lot of progress in the last month on the different projects that we said we'd undertake the last month. We made a bunch of progress on projects and hundreds. We're hoping that they will be up and running within less than a month. Uh, also, we've made some progress on the Solon. We're hopefully going to have that ready soon. We've got a procedure in place and a document created for people to get approved to get gate access and access to the Solon once we do a little training session. Uh, so we're going to get that all set up, but we got to finish getting the scopes ready first. So you know, one step at a time, but hopefully within about a month, we're getting close here. Um, any other new business that we wanted to announce? All right, Jeff. We can get started. Cool.
All right. Well, before we get to this month's program, uh, just a little look to the future. Um, I was really wrestling with December. We typically do our holiday party. It ends up being a potluck. You know, as we can see here, we've got a pretty equal amount of people tying in remotely as we do in person. Uh, we did not hold the, the holiday party last year, but I kind of ended up tipping towards the balance of let's hold the holiday party. I think it'll be fun just to relax. Understood that for the people that are still not comfortable joining us in person, um, you know, we still might be able to tie them in. Um, but anyhow, keep an eye on your emails. There'll be some more details about that coming forward. Um, but before we worry about next month, uh, the focus for tonight, we have a return visit from Professor Paul Halpern. This would mark his third visit to come uh, to the DAS. He's written 15 to 20 odd books, and he's spoken to us about two of them previously. The first one was a book about Einstein and Schrodinger. I, I think I'm getting the gist, Paul, that you write these books about these scientist duos. That's, well, that's been my, that's the uh, niche. My, 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 my <laughs> Actually, if you want to hold that, you, you, if you want to hold that first one up. Okay, I could show. <clears throat> I think it was called Einstein's Dice and Schrodinger's Cat. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, then he came to us later because I heard that he had written a book about my favorite scientist, which is Richard Feynman. So he wrote a book about Richard Feynman and John Wheeler, John Wheeler who, um, found out John Wheeler actually came and gave a talk to the DAS oh, yeah. back in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. John, we so, um, so he came and gave a talk to us about that book. And that takes us to today where he wrote, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jim. We, we were going to have him speaking to the DAS, but uh, Ace Vernon kidnapped him. Ah, and ah, had oh. a big meeting. And gotcha. So, um, Wheeler gave a, a long and interesting lecture, but I'm afraid I didn't understand most of it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so Paul returns today uh, to talk to us about, I assume a book hot off the presses. Yes. Which is called Flashes of Creation, talking about the Big Bang Theory. Okay. Um, and the scientists in this case are Hoyle, <laughs> Gar I, is it Garnow? Gamov. Okay, Gamov. Okay. Russian name. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and the three books that Paul just held up are actually, well, soon to be, once we make it official, um, DAS property we're going to be purchasing. We realized we've had Paul come and talk about these books. We should, we should have copies of them. So we will be adding those three books um, to our library. Um, in addition, I believe Paul wrote a few extra copies of his current book, which he is going to be offering first sale um, you know, I'm willing to sign them. Um, you know, after the meeting, obviously, Paul will hang out for a bit more so we can, you know, meet and greet and sign books and all that kind of stuff. If anybody would like a book, um, but maybe didn't come prepared to pay or whatever, um, the DAS can certainly facilitate with that, as well as if there's anybody online that would like a copy of the book. Um, again, we'd be happy to pay for it and you can reimburse us and we'll figure out somehow to get the book to you. Um, again, we just, you know, want to, we can certainly accommodate that somehow or another. And I believe Paul, you said the book is, what is, uh, well, why don't you give the price? $25. $25. Yeah. So he's offering his current book, which he's going to be talking all about tonight for $25 and I'd be willing to sign it. And again, we could extend that to anybody. Um, maybe what we'll do is at the end of the meeting, when we're doing our final Q and a, um, if there's anybody online, that would like a copy, just speak up. Or if you want, shoot me an email or a text message saying I want one and we'll, we, you know, we'll make sure that we get a copy put aside for you. Um, with that, Paul, glad you could join us tonight. <laughs> okay. um, our, and I'm gonna make sure, are we, oh, I gotta share, don't I? Yeah, there's three. Uh, and, how, and I'll be advancing the slides or? Yeah, it, is, does that work for you? Yeah, so where should I stand? You got why don't you can go right here okay. and you can either sit or stand and we'll get the camera okay, pointed just, accordingly. Just nah, you'll be fine. Can you click the middle one there? Not that one. You want to click the middle one so we can still see. Participants yeah. now can see you. Got it. Oh, and I'm gosh, 
I'm so out of practice here. Usual routine. Sorry, before we jump into this too far, I am going to mute everybody. You have to stop the chat. Um, yep. Okay. Unlike in the past where I've been monitoring the chat window for questions, um, I'm not going to be able to do that. So, Paul, question to you. Would you rather have people hold off questions or would you rather people just kind of shout them out as they think of them? What's, what's your comfort level? In terms of here or in terms of the Zoom? Meeting? Either, yeah. Uh, maybe hold off until the end. Okay, got it. So if people have questions, maybe jot it down. And once we get to the end, um, Paul will open up for a Q&A uh, just to, just to okay. keep with the flow of the discussion. So I will be muting everybody. Obviously, if there's some disaster or if you need to highlight something, please take yourself off mute and let us know what's going on. But click. otherwise, we would like to... Participate. It's over here, isn't it? Just click participate. And then there's a mute all at the bottom. All right, so you are all going on mute. Again, if you need to unmute for some reason, please feel free. But otherwise, at the end of Paul's talk, he will open up for questions. And we do need to unmute ourselves, right? No, you should, you're unmuted. Okay. Don't, don't, not that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there's a I'll just, Paul doesn't need to see that, so we'll shrink that you want, up. No, you want to click the, the board, there you go. I mean, but no one's going to be asking you questions. You need to see him in the Zoom. Oh, got it, for him to see himself. Yeah. Okay, uh, can some, are, are you guys seeing the PowerPoint okay at this point? Is this the first slide, Paul? No, it's oh. the second slide. And they're muted, so they can't answer you. Yeah, if someone can unmute, let me know if you're seeing the PowerPoint. Yes, yes, I can. Uh, I have to show this first slide where I show where I'm from and where I am now. Yeah, there we go. All right, yeah. sorry, boy, that was, uh, you think, you think I've been doing this for almost two years now. So, Paul, oh, it's all yours. Man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So it's great to be back. Uh, I got a little slightly lost. I was almost here and I made the wrong turn. So it shows I'm a theorist, not an experimentalist. <laughs> I theoretically knew how to get here. I'm kind of stubborn. I rely on my own sense of direction, usually in Google Maps. I'm not a GPS person. So maybe that's about time. But anyway, um, so I'm going to be talking about my latest book. Flashes of Creation, which I, I'm excited to find out that this week, the Wall Street Journal is reviewing it. Um, the New York Times already reviewed it. And, um, and also I'm gonna be on uh, a radio show, national radio show called Science Friday, which Ira is Flatow. with Ira Flatow. So he's um, recording me next week, but I'm not sure when it's gonna be aired. I know it's gonna be on a Friday, but probably the Friday after Thanksgiving or uh, not right after Thanksgiving, but the next week or two weeks from now. So uh, stay tuned. But I thank, uh, I thank Jeff for inviting me. And um, can every, yep. I think we're good. Paul, we're one good. last question before I forget. We are recording this session and we have a YouTube channel that we have been posting do you have any objection for no, us posting no that objection. video up there? No objection. Thank you. And we, we, we've got it on record that you've said that. So. Okay. <laughs> That's right. It reminds me, I was on once on a show for a previous book, a radio show called Coast to Coast AM, which is sort of a really late night show. And there's some strange people on it, but they yeah. sometimes invite people interested in astronomy, but sometimes it's like psychics and UFO people and so forth. But anyway, they make you sign a contract before going on the radio show, saying that you that they have the rights to rebroadcast what you said in perpetuity throughout the entire universe. <laughs> so, but I better not slip up, and it's at three a.m., so I have to be really careful. So, so anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, and let's see. Um, Maybe space bar. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So anyway. Um, so my book is based upon questions that have been asked really since the dawn of time. Uh, people have wondered for millennia, did time have a beginning? If so, what happened at that beginning point? How did the universe come into being? How did the stuff, the actual material in the universe emerge? How large is the universe? And also, will the universe someday perish or will it go on forever? Might there be continued cycles of time? So these are questions that have been talked about for millennia, but until the early 20th century, 
there was no accurate scientific way of answering these questions. It was just philosophers and religious people talking amongst themselves, debating and using logic, but not really having evidence for this. But starting in the early 20th century, that's when evidence started to come in for in many areas, theoretical and then experimental, which led, which, uh, led to the um, ideas about the, how the universe came about and how matter came about. So it was a very exciting time. And I, I think it's kind of humbling to think that there are people alive today who, when they were children, you know, they had to be pretty old, but when they were children, that's when the quantum revolution started. So the quantum revolution started in the 1920s. And before that was the relativity revolution. And there are people alive today who were, who were born before those times. So it's relatively recent that we had these revolutions. So, um, so a few revolutions of the early 20th century play a major role in scientific cosmology. Of course, there's Einstein's theory of relativity, both special relativity and general relativity. Special relativity has to do with high-speed objects. General relativity has to do with gravitation and how that affects objects. And then plus the quantum theory, which led to atomic physics and nuclear physics. Those all play an important part in understanding how the universe came to be. And if you look at the, um, let's see, uh, this one. Oh. Yeah, right down here is two fellows, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr, each played a role in the quantum revolution and Einstein was behind the relativity revolution. So let's look back to 1915, which is an important year for my chronicle. 1915 was the year that Einstein's general theory of relativity was released, it was published then. And also that was the year of two of one of the two main characters in my book, Fred Hoyle was born that year in a small town called Bingley in Yorkshire. And I visited there during the research for my book. And one thing I got lucky about with the book is I had a research sabbatical. It was in 2019, right before the pandemic started. So I went to England uh, and got to travel and, and see all these things. And then um, in, early, in early 2020, right up the book. So. Der Hesche drei in Herr Allgemeinen Fassung belegen, Substitute Tertuschonen, der Raum seit Variabilität gegen Nummer Kovar. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> 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 or at least translating. I mean, Danke <laughs> schön. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay. Yeah, well, anyway, um, so that's that's how it sounds. <laughs> that's very relative. Um, and uh, I just put that up it just as the field equations of, of gravitation by Albert Einstein. And then that's a plaque where Fred Hoyle was born. And I'll say a little bit about his birthplace. He grew up in kind of a working class environment, a milling town. His uh, father was involved in milling. His, his mother worked at a movie theater as the pianist. She accomp accompanied the, the silent movies with her piano playing. And the story is that at one point, they noticed that she was playing classical music instead of the sort of kitschy, music that went along with like Westerns and so forth. And they fired her and then people stopped coming to the movies because they were just there to hear her classical performances. <laughs> so that was Fred Hoyle's mother. And so Fred Hoyle grew up going to movies a lot and he was very a very cinematic person. Um, we'll see that the main characters, our protagonists were larger than life figures and almost like you know heroes from the movies, which was pretty cool. So I'm going to um, summarize what general relativity is because it plays such an important part of, in, in uh, cosmology. And I'm gonna use the words of John Wheeler who uh, almost uh, came to a club meeting. Mm -hmm. Space tells matter how to move, matters tell space how to curve. Mm -hmm. So in other words, 
if you look at the sun, the sun is weighing down on the fabric of space-time, creating a dent, gravitational dent. The planets all want to move in a straight line, but because of this dent, they move in elliptical orbits. So that was Einstein's way of trying to describe gravitation using the warping of space-time. And you can do this locally. You can look at the solar system, or you can actually apply this theory to the entire universe, which Einstein would do. Yes. So Einstein, uh, right after he came up with this theory, he said, let's apply it to the universe. And we know the answer. So let's see if we get the right answer. The answer, he said, according to Newton, according to antiquity, is that the stars move, the nebulae, which at that time they weren't sure what they were, gas clouds or galaxies move, but the actual fabric of space is static. That's just the backdrop. So therefore, he said, my theory should predict a static universe, one that's unchanging over time. Mm -hmm. But then when he plugged into his equations, he plugged in the matter on one side, he got the answer for space on the other side, and it said that space is unstable. It's either going to expand or contract. So he thought he made a grave error. So he put a stabilizing factor into his theory called the cosmological constant to try to support the theory and make the solution static. And that worked, but it was very inelegant. So it was a little bit like if you took the Leaning Tower of Pisa and built a scaffolding to support it, um, the Leaning Tower is, is a beautiful building, but the scaffolding is not going to be beautiful. It might be functional, but it's not beautiful. So the cosmological constant was an add-on that wasn't really um, as elegant as the, the rest of the theory. So then a few years later, a cosmologist and meteorologists, he had two, two roles in Russia in what was called um, Leningrad at the time, is now St. Petersburg, and was St. Petersburg before then, um, looked at Einstein's equations and tried to come up with solutions. And he actually looked at expanding solutions. He was interested in those and sent them to Einstein. And Einstein was, well, that's ridiculous. Those aren't real solutions. But later Einstein sort of regretted that. So in Friedman's model, the universe blows up like a balloon. And if we notice the objects on the balloon, those are supposed to represent galaxies. They move farther apart over time. So they start out being very close together, but then all of them move far apart. So you might say, where's the, where's the center of this expansion? The center is not actually on the surface of the balloon, it's inside. So there's no place in the universe where the universe has a center of expansion. All places expand equally, which is a little bit of, hard, of a hard concept for people to grasp. One of the questions I get asked very often is, where is the spot in the universe where the Big Bang took place? And can we go there and like dig up evidence there? Well, no, there's no real spot everywhere uh, expands equally and everywhere is the center. So Freeman, happened to have a student in his general relativity class that he taught in, uh, in Leningrad named George Gamow. And he's the second protagonist of the book. Gamow was born in the city of Odessa, which is now part of the Ukraine. So um, he's in a sense, Russian Ukrainian. And he went up to Leningrad um, to study because it was a very good university. Um, at that time, it was the early phases of the Soviet Union. It was in turmoil and it was a revolutionary time. So his study, studies kept getting interrupted. Uh, but then he became fascinated by general relativity, taking Friedman's course and wanted to work with Friedman. But alas, in 1925, Friedman, who I said was also a meteorologist, went up in a hot air balloon and he got kind of sick on the balloon and then decided to take a vacation uh, down to the Crimea. And then some time later uh, got ill from typhoid. So we don't know if, if you know, one was a cause of the other going up in the balloon, but he, he was unhealthy in his, 
is last month's. Excuse me, Paul. Yes. I'm trying to get rid of that panel at the top. I think you can click more. I just looked it up. Yes. Up at the top there was yeah, more. All the way on the right. There yeah. you go. And it says hide video panel somewhere there. Yeah. About halfway yeah. down. There you go, right there. Excellent. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, click anywhere on the screen now. And click anywhere on the, the screen now. The, and like the yellow, and then I'll uh, Did you get rid of that ribbon up there? Yeah, it's trying. Yeah. It wasn't there before. Yeah. Uh, maybe the escape button. Did the escape button? Uh, Don't open it. Uh, yeah. I should have seen it. I'll swim in. We tried. <laughs> Never trust anybody out of state. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. I'm used to teens. Share screen. It had gone. It had gone away before. Yeah. Is it bothering people at the top? Can you drag it down to the bottom? Yeah, you can do that. Maybe yeah. push it off to the right. right down. Make yeah. it it's off right. as low as it goes. Yeah, it's just go over there. It's kind of to get rid of it. Well, once you told it to hide, maybe with some inactivity. <laughs> like... No, that might be true. High floating. Mm -hmm. There's a there was a high floating, floating message. Yeah, high floating, floating meeting control. control. Down, down, down. There you go. Hey. 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 Okay, now you can see my entire slides. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Oh, it was apostrophe S. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, that's the space bar work. It didn't, but it's funny. Sometimes with PowerPoint, um, they like the first time you try to push an hour, the space bar doesn't work. Right. Oh, because it's not selected. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But now I think it's working. Yep. So, um, so anyway, so so George Gamow could not work with Friedman because Friedman died uh, at a young age. Uh, so, but it turned out to be a little bit of a blessing in disguise because Gamow went into quantum physics and he made his mark in quantum physics and later used some of those ideas. To understand how how stars uh, fuse, uh, engage in fusion. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about Edwin Hubble, who I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard about. Um, he made his major discoveries in the 1920s, including the recession of the galaxies. And some some of you may know that he was also a fantastic basketball player. He played for University of Chicago in two two winning seasons, and then coached basketball at, um, at a high school in Indiana. He's like 5'7". <laughs> I'm just saying, look, he doesn't look that tall. Back then, people were a lot smaller. Yeah. So, so anyway, this is, this is his data for recession of the galaxies. Now, this changed everything because all of a sudden, people looked at this and said, hey, wait a minute. If, if the farther away the galaxies are moving faster, that kind of supports something like Friedman's balloon model of the universe expanding. But strangely enough, Hubble, uh, little known fact, Hubble never agreed with the idea that the universe is expanding. He always said, well, I just produced the data. I'm not gonna take an opinion on that. So, so he was nev never advocating for that. Now, there was someone else at the time who was advocating for the idea that the universe started very small. And he was vindicated when Hubble's discoveries came out. Uh, George Lemaitre, who was a Belgian cosmologist and priest. And here he is with Einstein. And the two of them didn't always see eye to eye. When Lemaitre in 1927 sent Einstein a paper saying that the universe is expanding and started mm -hmm. as a kind of small object, which he called a primeval atom, and then started expanding from that. Einstein was also dubious because he didn't quite believe in expanding universe yet. But then after Hubble's results came out, Einstein became a true believer in the expanding universe, even more so than Hubble. And then he turned to Lemaitre and Lemaitre uh, revised his theory to take into account Hubble's data. And together they worked on expanding models of the universe. And this is Lemaitre's book, the primeval atom, the ideas about the origin of the universe. But Lamatra was, as a priest, he was on the quiet side. So he didn't really trumpet his ideas. He didn't really know how to work the media, in other words. Now, George Gamow, as we'll see, and Fred Hoyle both knew how to work the media. 
So that's why they became a uh, little, little later the most, uh, what the best known cosmologists. So here's Gamov um, with uh, John Cocroft, a um, particle physicist. And Gamov, as I said, started out in quantum physics. He learned the laws of quantum physics as applied to atoms. And then um, he found out about a big dilemma having to do with nuclear physics. So if you have a radioactive atom like uranium, it sometimes expels particles. And then you could take particles and bombard other atoms with those particles and create new isotopes. So that's nuclear physics. So you can create new isotopes by letting you know, the radioactive atoms decay, or you can bombard a radio, uh, an atom with um, you know, something like a proton or something called an alpha particle, which is two protons and two neutrons and create something new. Well, obviously there's something that sticks a nucleus together, which is a strong force, but then particles, if they're both positive, tend to repel from each other because like particles repel. So the question is, how do particles cross the barrier so they get close enough so that they can stick together? Well, Gamov knew about something called quantum tunneling, where particles in atomic physics can get through an energy barrier through mere chance. So if, if you attended my talk some years ago about Einstein's dice, this was like the dice rolling of quantum physics where things probabilistically can lead to a jump, a quantum leap from one place to another that wouldn't happen under the normal classical laws of physics, but happen in quantum physics due to chance, the laws of chance. So Gamow said, well, um, that you can, when you bombard uh, nuclei with other nuclei, that they have a finite chance of crossing a barrier and the same thing with radioactive decay, they have a chance of crossing a barrier. He did a calculation, it took him one night, he did it overnight and came up with a formula, which is still used today to calculate decay rates and collision rates for nuclear particles. And that, he made his mark that way, he became known as kind of a genius uh, for that discovery. And that led to an understanding of how fusion takes place in stars, because fusion takes place under very high temperatures where protons can collide with each other, overcome this barrier through quantum tunneling. Sometimes uh, protons decay and become neutrons and then form something else, which in the case of a proton and a neutron would be a deuteron or the nucleus of deuterium, which is a heavy form of hydrogen. And then through that process, through more um, bombardment with protons, eventually the stars build up helium and they release energy in the process. And that's how stars shine, the stars that are hydrogen burning. So this was a really exciting discovery. Arthur Eddington, uh, had postulated that four protons come together, but that model never really worked. But, um, but Hans Bethe and others took Gamow's idea and built up the idea of the proton-proton cycle, which is a way hydrogen can go through a chain reaction of processes and become helium. So Gamow's theory also was used to create the first particle colliders to be able to bombard particles with nuclei. Now, Gamov at a certain point decided to escape the Soviet Union because it was getting too ideological. So um, scientists were starting to be told, you need to incorporate Marxist-Leninist ideas in your, in your work. So, um, and Gamov really, really didn't say a way, way to do that. So he decided to escape First, he tried with a rubber kayak in the Black Sea. He was trying to uh, sail to Turkey in the kayak or, or row to Turkey. And uh, he was there with his young wife. And, um, and they, they got in the boat and it was fine the first day, but then um, it became 
turbulent and there was a storm and they were blown back home from the shore. So they never escaped that way. But then Niels Bohr arranged for Gamow to get an invitation to a major conference called the 1933 Salve Conference in Brussels. And Gamow clamored to get his wife an invitation. His wife was a physicist and she got an invitation too, uh, finally. And they went to Brussels and they never came back. Now Einstein was supposed to be at this conference, but he, um, at that time, the Nazis had taken power in Germany and Einstein was um, a wanted man in Germany. There was a bounty on his head. So he couldn't really attend the conference. And he, by that point, he moved to the United States. So he, if you look at this poster very carefully, it says uh, Albert Einstein uh, in absentia, meaning that, that he was supposed to be there, but he never really came. So Gamow moved to the United States because he thought it would be safer. He went to the University of Michigan to give some lectures. And then there he got an invitation to George Washington University. So he promptly bought a ticket to Seattle. And then before <laughs> finding out that George Washington University is in Washington, DC. <laughs> so I managed to exchange the ticket and go to the right place, luckily. Meanwhile, uh, Fred Hoyle, um, we last saw him when he, when he was born, but um, he became in also interested in nuclear physics. So that was his passion. He studied at Cambridge with some of, some of the greats. His advisor was a famous quantum physicist named Paul Dirac. And then he got a job at Cambridge, which was interrupted by World War II. He had to do some um, radar work in World War II and then came back in 1945 to Cambridge. And he started becoming interested in applying nuclear physics to stellar processes. <laughs> that became a really big deal because once you understand how hydrogen builds up into helium in the stars, then there was this open question, how does everything else happen? Um, where does it happen? How does it happen? So this became a question that both thinkers would address. Gamow met with a famous astronomer, Walter Bade. Bade had a, a theory about stellar populations, that there are population one stars, which are the current generation of stars, but then they were preceded by population two stars, which were a mass of stars that were mostly hydrogen, and they ran through their life, lifespan and uh, exploded in supernova and created the elements that were that seeded this generation of stars. So, um, so that was uh, that that was the essence of, of Body's theory, and uh, Hoyle thought that was fascinating and decided to run with that and come up with a theory of how all the elements were created in stars and in supernova. So he came up with a theory that all the higher chemical elements from helium to, um, to iron and, and eventually, um, well, from helium to iron were forged in dying stars. And then the elements higher than that were forged in supernova explosions and released into space. And that's called stellar nucleosynthesis. Now around this time, Hoyle and two of his friends and colleagues, uh, Thomas Gold, and Herman Bondi, so here's Tommy Gold and Herman Bondi, went to see a movie called The Dead of Night. And this is a horror movie. And it's, it's known as, as the horror movie that spawned a universe because um, the theme of the horror movie was that somebody goes to a country house and has a feeling that he, he had been there before, perhaps in his dreams or nightmares, and that something really bad would happen. And then as the film progresses, people start telling stories about all these nightmarish situations and kind of spook each other. And then in the end, something terrible does happen. I'm not gonna give it away. And uh, it, it kind of involves this, <laughs> um, this ventriloquist and his dummy. 
um, Hugo. So, uh, Charlie McCarthy. Yeah, a little bit like Charlie McCarthy, but evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, it was one of the first movies where the theme was the, the ventriloquist dummy comes to life and becomes evil. Mm -hmm. um, there's been many other films like that. So anyway, so then horrible things happen and then the main character suddenly wakes up. It was all a nightmare and he's, he's relieved. And then he gets a phone call and he gets an invitation to a party at that country house and the whole thing starts all over. <laughs> so uh, it just keeps happening. So then afterwards, after that film to calm down, they all go to Herman Bondi's apartment in Cambridge and they drink some brandy and relax. And then Tommy Gold says, hey, what if the universe is like that? It, it never has an end and never has a beginning. Now you would think that that would, you know, uh, suggest the idea of cycles, but they thought, well, of something that would constantly regenerate itself, not really cycles, but a universe that would pretty much stay the same over time. So the idea they came up with is called the steady state universe, and it doesn't cycle, it expands, but if you notice, unlike the picture we saw before with the balloons, the number of uh, the density of the galaxies stays the same. So you always have pretty much equal spacing of galaxies, even though the universe is expanding. Well, how can that come to be? Well, it's because as old galaxies move away from each other, new galaxies form over billions of years. And the, the way the new, new galaxies form is that slight bits of matter appear in the vacuum just randomly through quantum processes. So all of a sudden a proton appears and then maybe a neutron. And then they start to cluster together. And then just through random chance and gravity, over time they build up into larger and larger formations. And finally they become shining stars and then they combine into galaxies and they create the new galaxies. So that's a steady state model. Now you might say, well, what's the appeal of it? Well, at that time, there was really no evidence that the universe was changing over time. People didn't realize that galaxies develop. They thought, you know, whatever, however far out you look, galaxies are pretty much the same. And they also uh, thought that there was a big complex between the idea of the universe emerging from a point and the age of stars. If you used Hubble's data to calculate the age of the universe in the 1940s and 1950s, you would come up with an answer of two to three billion years old, which is younger than Earth. But so it made the expanding universe theories didn't make sense if you looked at that timeline. So people who believed in it said, oh, well, the timeline must be wrong then. But it took generations to kind of come up with new uh, telescopic techniques to, to come up with the, the real timeline, which is 13.8 billion years. So Gamov um, worked with uh, a student at uh, George Washington University named Ralph Alpher. And they've developed a paper with an idea that was very different than stellar nucleosynthesis. It was big bang nucleosynthesis, but the, the term big bang wasn't invented yet. So they just said, um, they just said how the chemical elements were created in the hot early universe. So the universe, when it was small, was very, very hot. And they calculated that it would have the temperature to produce in the first five minutes, all the elements from helium up to uranium, they, they thought. And they published a paper and at the last minute, Gamov really loved practical jokes and puns. He added the name of nuclear physicist Hans Beta so he could make a pun on the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma. So it was, it was alpha, beta, gamma paper. So it's always known as Alpha Beta Gamma. It happened to be published on April Fool's Day. 
1948. So some people might not have taken it so seriously. And Beta didn't really object. He just, just thought it was strange that his name was added to a paper, even though he didn't do any work, <laughs> um, just for a pun. But he was sort of friends of Gamov and didn't object. Alpha, though, was upset for the rest of his life that this was his PhD thesis. And uh, graduate students have it bad enough that sometimes their advisor gets more credit, but then to have a third scientist get credit for not doing anything, like equal credit to him, and he did all the work. So uh, he had some gripes. <laughs> um, although by reports, Ralph Alpha was pretty calm and wasn't really that um, adamant in his gripes. But then um, his son, uh, apparently is still upset about a lot of things and, and actually, um, well, he, uh, his son, uh, Victor Alpha, is, is, feels like his father never gets enough credit for anything, and including, he said, I didn't give his father enough credit in, in my book, so, mm -hmm. um, but, but I, I think I did. I, I put a lot about Ralph Alpha, but anyway, I, I, um, you know, I was trying to be fair and trying to trying to represent history accurately. But anyway, so that was the paper. And they called the, the original substance of the universe LEM, which is actually, uh, I don't know if any of you know me medieval Latin. Any medieval Latin scholars here? Okay. Uh, it's medieval Latin for the word for matter in medieval Latin. And Ralph Alpha happened to know that. So they, they said Lem was the stuff of the early universe. And then when they published a paper, they took a bottle of liqueur and put a, wrote Lem on it and they celebrated with that bottle. And that bottle is now in the Smithsonian Institution. And Alpha gave a talk about the idea. And this was reported in the Washington Post and then the famous cartoonist Herb Block, who some of you may remember, um, published the cartoon. He, he had a series of cartoons about uh, the atom bomb, uh, expressing his opinion about things. So here the atom bomb is, is dubious that the Big Bang explosion could happen in five minutes. Um, so he's, he's kind of pondering that, five minutes a. So there's a big problem with uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. The universe cools very quickly because it's expanding. And by several minutes after the Big Bang, it's too cool to produce carbon. Carbon, it turns out, requires an exceedingly high temperature to produce. It's a, it's a complicated process that involves two helium nuclei coming together and before they, they're very highly unstable. They form a, a very unstable form of beryllium. And in the trillionth of a second before the beryllium decays, it has to be bombarded with another helium atom. And then they undergo a quantum process where they become a, a form of carbon-12. And that process was explained first by Gamow. So Gamow showed that that process can happen in stars where their cores start to contract. They can reach, you need to get up to um, about 100 million degrees Kelvin temperature. And uh, that's possible in shrinking stellar cores. So Hoyle developed the idea that carbon was produced in shrinking stellar cores. And supposedly he said um, at one point that carbon had to be you had to find some way of producing it because if carbon wasn't produced, he wouldn't be here. No one will be here. So the fact that we're here means that carbon-12 must, must have been produced. So in 1949, Foyle becomes kind of a radio uh, celebrity on the BBC, and he coins the term Big Bang Theory as a disparaging term, kind of like, oh, well, the sensible idea is a steady state because things kind of happen gradually, new matters created. But then there's a strange idea 
that there's this giant explosion and then everything blows up and we get everything. And he called that the Big Bang to make fun of it. So um, he managed to convince a lot of people in the UK. So Steady State became very popular in the UK, uh, became almost the, the state the state sanctioned theory of the universe at one point. They were both masters of popularization. Gamma was on television um, and Hoyle, Hoyle was on the radio a lot. They both wrote books. Um, in the 1950s, he went to a, a uh, let's say a newsstand. You could pick up and you, you saved up your money as books were very expensive back then, you could get Gamov's The Creation of the Universe for 50 cents or Hoyle's The Nature of the Universe for 35 cents. <laughs> so if you couldn't afford, I guess you were stuck with the steady state theory if you couldn't afford the extra <laughs> dime and a nickel. For 15 the cent difference. Yeah, yeah. It was a big deal. That was an <laughs> <laughs> and they wrote... Popular science and science fiction. They were really Renaissance people, which was one reason I was attracted to um, to writing the book. Is they weren't just scientists; they were experts in popularization. They uh, they wrote science fiction. Um, Gamov started the Mister Tompkins series, which is about a bank clerk who finds himself in these strange quantum and relativistic worlds and learns a lot about physics. And that series was continued by Gamov's son until last year. Gamov's son died recently, but last year, the last Mr. Tompkins book was produced <laughs> by his son. Um, and then uh, Fred Hoyle wrote lots of science fiction, including the award-winning Black Cloud. Gamov was a funny cartoonist. He illustrated all his books. This is, this might be the first parody of Mickey Mouse. The Mickey Mouse cartoons came out in the late 1920s and Gamov did a series of quantum, quantum physics as, um, as acted out by the Mickey Mouse characters. So uh, this is Mickey Mouse pretending to be Niels Bohr in 1931, which is very early. And this is, um, has to do with the hydrogen bomb development this is supposed to be Edward Teller and Stanislav Ulam. Hoyle wrote libretti for two operas, including the opera Copernicus, which you can hear online on YouTube, which is pretty amazing. Now, how many people involved in astronomy or astrophysics wrote operas? Pretty amazing. And as I mentioned, the steady state theory was very popular for a time because the Big Bang Theory shows that the universe is younger than its stars, which didn't make any sense. But nevertheless, um, the Pope uh, at the time, Pope Pius, endorsed the Big Bang Theory in the early 1950s, but the Astronomer Royal of the UK endorsed the Steady State Theory. So this is Lamatra with Pope Pius. Lamatra actually thought that science and religion should be kept separate, even though he's a priest. But Pope Pius thought that the Big Bang Theory was kind of, in a way, sort of endorsement of biblical genesis. How would the battle be resolved? The answer came thanks to a converted radio receiver for communication satellite. So this is a Bell Labs radio receiver. And when it was no longer used for um, satellite communications, um, astronomers got a crack at using it to try to look for gal galactic halos. So two astronomers, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson, converted the horn antenna to astronomical use. You can still visit the horn antenna today. I, I went up there. You drive up to Homedale, New Jersey, to the former site of Bell Labs. And uh, I, I went there and I, I Thought it would be kind of hard to get into but you just go into this parking lot and it's right there and i was a little surprised as i approached it i heard this loud blaring rock music coming from that direction and i thought that must be the wrong instrument looks like it but 
rock, blurring rock music was coming out of it. So then uh, out of curiosity, I climbed up into the cabin and there was like someone um, was using it as an amplifier. <laughs> I put like, you know, MP3 free, free player in there and was blasting it so that there was some company picnic there. So it's sacrilege, you know, how can they do that? But, um, I, I worry a little bit about that instrument because it's like very, uh, it's, it's too accessible for something so important in the history of science. So anyway, they were looking for signals from the Milky Way halo. They didn't find that. Instead, they found a persistent background hiss. And this is their strip chart. And uh, these are their instruments, which are, the actual instruments are now in, in Munich, uh, which Penzi has donated. And I, I talked to both of them um, while writing the book, which is a real honor. And uh, Penzi has, unfortunately has some memory issues now, but for some reason, but he, he was very interesting to talk to, very enthusiastic, very friendly. And he had good recollection of his childhood. He escaped from Nazi Germany when he was a, little, when he was a child, which is pretty remarkable. And they were trying to find the source of this background hiss that was persistent. No matter which way they turned the receiver, they had this hiss. And they thought it was noise from New York City. They ruled that out. No, ambient noise, they ruled that out. And finally, they thought it was white electric material dropped from pigeons. <laughs> and uh, they cleaned that up <laughs> and then um, caged the pigeons. But still, the hiss persisted. And finally, they called an eminent um, experimental physicist, Robert Dickey of Princeton. Princeton was actually, uh, Dickey was actually working on a radio receiver himself to try to prove a theory that there was a universe before ours that left behind radiation uh, during the Big Bang. And after he got off the phone, he told his assistants, including this guy, Jim Peebles, um, who won the Nobel Prize recently. We've been scooped, boys. Mm -hmm. And then Peebles did a calculation of the Hiss, and it turned out to be to match predictions for leftover radiation from the early universe, and, and it was calculated to be about three degrees above absolute zero. And then soon it was in the papers, such as the New York Times. Bob Wilson, I asked Bob Wilson, when he knew how famous the theory was. And he said, when his father went to the corner drugstore, picked up a copy of the New York Times, came back and said, hey, Bob, your, instru your instrument's in the cover of the New York Times. <laughs> so, and, uh, so that was pretty exciting. And uh, Wilson, interestingly enough, was before this was a believer in the steady state theory. Um, so that was interesting. And then immediately, Gamov and Alfred pointed out that Alfred had calculated the temperature of the radiation, background radiation, um, way back in 1949. And Gamov had done some calculations too. They weren't as, as close, but they wanted credit. And at one conference, Gamov told astronomers, um, well, if you lose a penny and someone else finds a penny, it's the same penny, the same with my, my uh, calculations. So, um, so uh, but Gamov, unfortunately, he, he died in 1968, so perhaps didn't get all the credit he deserved. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize, but never got it. Hoyle uh, lived much longer. He briefly thought the Big Bang must be correct because he couldn't quite calculate the amount of helium in the universe. So he said the Big Bang was great at producing helium. So Gamow's theory was correct from hydrogen to helium. Not, not the rest of the elements, but just the first two elements. So, but then Hoyle started to come up with alternatives, including the idea of little bangs in, in uh, quasars. And he kept going with his theories and he used to critique, criticize Big Bang adherents to be like, flocks of geese following a lead goose to nowhere. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so then his, uh, someone he worked with, uh, Jeff Burbage, I happened to meet in 2007, 
who and Jeff Burbridge is also <laughs> still a believer in the modification of the steady state. And I said to him, what do you think of big bang theorists? And he said, I like lemmings leading other lemmings off a cliff. <laughs> so it was kind of a variation of that. Wait, in 2007, there's a physicist who doesn't believe in the big bang theory? Yeah, and there is there are today. Still, you know, there's still giant Nalikar, who is Hoyle's assistant, is still alive. He's in India and believes in the quasi steady state theory. So it's called the quasi steady state because it's not quite the same. It's it's that the hide the helium is produced in uh, galactic events, not not in the beginning of the universe. They also part of the Flat Earth Society or? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Okay. I, actually, I met John Dobson and talked to him about it. I think he also ascribes to that, that hypothesis. Really? Well. No. A quasi state. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they each were mavericks until the end. Uh, Gamma was honored with a plaque at GWU, Hoyle with a statue. And uh, they were really remarkable people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw Hoyle speak once in Philadelphia, and I thought it was a very good talk. I never met or saw Gamow, um, but um, they're really remarkable and Renaissance people for sure. Mm -hmm. So more for more about this, um, pick up my book, but I'd be glad to answer any questions. And I'm offering the book, signed copies for pretty much the price I get them for, which is $25 if anybody's interested, uh, but I'd be glad to take questions either from, um, from the Zoom audience, from the live audience. Yeah, they can take care of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to, Jeff? Yeah. Um, yeah, so first of all, Paul, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're open for questions at this point. So, I, you know, we'll just open it up. Zoom people, if you want to unmute yourself and ask away, or people in the audience here, ask away. Yeah, well, maybe you should show, you can, like, you get out of this. Yeah. Get out of screen share and show it's, you. It's, it's, yeah. I can see what they look like. Right on. Yeah. Thank you, Steve, buddy. Okay. Yeah, right on. There we go. There they are. Cool. And let me just check something here. Oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess they could also post in the chat, but. So you mentioned um, you were drawn, I, I guess, what, what led to you being drawn towards these two scientists and then also to kind of combine them together into this story? Okay, yeah, so I grew up um, reading a lot of science books, but one of the science books that influenced me the most was a book called One, Two, Three, Infinity by George Gamow. Okay. And it was this brilliant book illustrated about all these strange ideas in science, including um, ideas of like why some things are left-handed, some things are right-handed, and you know, wonderfully drawn, all these concepts of mathematics, um, there's something called the Tower of Hanoi, which is mm -hmm. taking, you know, discs and moving them and figuring out how long it would take to do different combinations. So I was fascinated by that. And I became interested in gamma. And, uh, and then I started hearing about the debate, you know, uh, between, I would hear about the debate between the Big Bang and Steady State, even though it was pretty much when I was a kid, it was pretty much resolved. So um, I was born in the 60s. So by then, by 64, 65, it was resolved. But still, when I was, you know, when I was a little older than that, I think some people had not quite mm -hmm. felt it was settled yet. So people were saying, you know, for example, a friend, my best friend in uh, middle school had a, his father read a lot and was always saying like, you know, I wonder which is correct, the Big Bang or Steady State. So a lot, a lot of people were still talking about it. And then, um, and I was interested in the life of Hoyle. And then I met, you know, Hoyle's assistant, um, Jeff Burbage, and heard a little bit more about, 
you know, some of Hoyle's work. So then I think gra gradually ideas gelled for a book about Gamow. I put that in my ideas file and a book about Hoyle. I put it in my ideas file. And then um, a few years ago, I was trying to pitch another book. So between Quantum Labyrinth and this book, there was yet another book called Synchronicity, which is about um, the work of Wolfgang Pauli, the quantum physicist, and trying to explain spooky quantum connections and things like that. So anyway, I proposed the idea to basic books and they didn't get back to me after about a week or so. And I was thinking, well, maybe I'll reframe the idea, but then I thought, well, maybe I'll come up with an alternative idea. And suddenly I thought, well, I've wanted to write about gamma, but I wanted to write about oil. Maybe since they liked the idea of two scientists debating from my previous books, I'll have like oil versus gamma. And then they came back to me and they said, we like both of your ideas, the synchronicity and flashes of creation. Why don't you write two books? So it seemed like a good idea at the time. But then um, I wrote the first book and then I was, it was a little exhausting writing the first book. And then I thought, well, I'll take a break. And I did the research for the second book uh, in 2019, fall 2019. And then I was kind of like, well, I'll get around to the flashes of creation. And then the pandemic hit. And I realized I'd only written a small portion of the book. And my typical habit for writing is to go to like coffee shops and, mm -hmm. because it's a nice place to get away. and and uh, there's music and people don't usually bother you at a coffee shop and I could just sit there and type. And then I thought, oh, I can't really go to coffee shops because they're all closed. I guess I'll have to write in my dining room table. So I kind of forced myself to write at my, at my dining room table with my dog, uh, Kepler, is not my dog's name, but, uh, staring up at me. And he wasn't named by me. He was named by my wife, my dog Kepler, because my wife wanted to incentivize me or give me an incentive for wanting to have a dog. So she's got uh, name no. after science. <laughs> so yeah. that's the story behind Kepler, the yeah. poodle. So anyway, um, so I always felt kind of sitting at home, you know, that there are all these chores to do, all these things to do around the house. And then the dog is always looking like he's bored, like I need to play with him. But then I sort of somehow got over that. And in three months, of concentrated effort wrote, wrote the first draft of the book. Mm -hmm. It was kind of, but if I find if I work really hard on something, I go into this different mode of thinking. Like, I'm just like, all of a sudden, just thinking about the book all the time. I dream about the book, dream about the characters. I wake up and all of a sudden, like a few paragraphs of writing pop into my head. It's a very strange experience, but, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it <laughs> but because like, it's not really good for like relationships. <laughs> like my wife will ask me something, you know, and I'll be like, oh, I got to get this down and this paragraph down and, and like, uh, you know, it's weird because like, I'll, I'll just have like, uh, you know, whole idea or whole paragraph in my <clears throat> head and I just have to get it down. So, so you ignore Kepler, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yep. But, uh, so to kind of to jump off of Todd's comment for a bit, I guess, could you speak to, I'm, I mean, <clears throat> I assume we would not put steady state theory today on parity with flat earth theory. I guess, is there any, I mean, you know, eh, science is always well, about, I guess my point is, where in the credibility scale would you say that debate stands today? Well, I mean, people say the nice thing about the steady state theory was that it was falsifiable. I guess you could say that about flat earth too, but, um, but, but steady state theory was falsifiable in a way that really required, you know, number of scientific instruments. You know, you needed, you needed to, like the background radiation um, was a major step forward. Uh, before that, they were looking at like, yeah, gamma ray counts to try to uh, figure out if if this matter creation idea was possible. 
and, and things like that. So there's a lot of good science that have developed from trying to prove or disprove the steady state theory. Um, I guess I guess I kind of feel like like the flat earth theory is just so easily um, proved wrong and it has been for like yeah you know <laughs> since we had satellites yeah no. yeah like way, before for, that. Way, way before that I mean yeah. you know people navigating on the oceans and so forth so so I don't really have I don't I doubt that there are any flat earthers. In this <laughs> I don't want to dis flat earthers. Tim, I came here for I came here for a, 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 a astrology. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there was a there was a movie recently about a guy who promotes flat Earth, and like the science made no sense at all. It was just kind of like mm -hmm. everything's a simulation. Like great. So it all goes back to. Q. So yeah, I guess that's kind of what I was getting at. So like I would say in the spectrum or the continuum. I don't think I can't imagine there's anyone that would be considered a serious scientist that believes in flat earth theory, but it sounds like there are some perhaps serious scientists that still prescribe to the steady state. So maybe in the well, okay. So you get what I'm what I'm kind of getting at? I guess speaking, I guess the general idea that the universe regenerates itself, that is kind of persistent because there's something called eternal inflation. And internal inflation is the idea that you had this giant um, energy field and that you had these random fluctuations in the energy field and that if the fluctuations were strong enough, they would trigger an expansion of that part of the universe. And this is a, this is a theory a lot of people believe in and that would trigger an ultra rapid expansion called inflation and that and then that expansion would slow down and that became the Hubble expansion. So basically instead of the Big Bang being a single event, the Big Bang is just kind of a, a little bit of a, a glitch or a little bit of a fluctuation in this vast field of energy, but you could also have other Big Bangs. And sometimes that's called the bubble universe idea that you have all these bubble universes like like soap bubbles in a giant bath. Um, so, and that theory actually came out before Hoyle died. So mm. I was sort of wondering how he would react to it. And he was kind of like, well, you know, you see my, my, the, my steady state theory wasn't so wrong after all, because this inflation idea is a little bit like steady state, but he sort of wanted, he, what he wanted people to do was to kind of adopt his idea rather than him switching over to this inflation idea. Hmm. But there are some connections between steady state and modern ideas that the Big Bang is not unique, that there, there are other universes out there. So, uh, okay. but, but no one really believes in the standard steady state anymore. They believe in this quasi steady state. Mm -hmm. A few people do. And the quasi steady state just basically requires that um, that helium production doesn't happen at the beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. But they also have a weird the theory about the cosmic microwave background that it's produced by um, iron filings in space. Mm -hmm. I find it a little bit strange mm -hmm. that that absorb light and then happen to radiate it outward at at a temperature of three degrees Kelvin. So um, I, I find that part part of it really far fetched. And you gotta ask me about the problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're like just bits of iron from uh, you know ex exploding stars and so forth. But that part I think is really far fetched. Hmm. So, any any other questions from? Yeah. yeah, is there is there a set of experiments that physicists would like to do? but the technology hasn't caught up yet to do these. Like if you look at Penzias and Wilson, I'm sure, you know, before the, te the radio technology for satellite communication became available, they said, we, you know, we would like to do this experiment, but technology hasn't caught up to it yet, but then it does. And they're able to do the experiment. So something on the table right now. Or oh Penzias yeah, lots of stuff. All of that would, that would like, you know, prove, prove this one way or the other. Well, the problem is, so you have, um, 
particle theory now is stuck because they can't unite all four fundamental forces. Right. So gravitation is the odd force out. And the major, the main idea between for uniting the forces is called string theory, but string theory is untestable at current energies. So if you if you could build a collider, the largest collider today is like like 27 miles, the one in Switzerland. Yeah. But if you if you could build, or it's 27 kilometers, uh, if you could build a collider that was, you know, the size of the earth. <laughs> Or something like that, a ring the size of the earth. Perhaps you could test the energies needed to prove string theory, but you know, it would be so, ex I mean, it'd be ridiculously expensive to do something like that. Impossible to do with the size of the earth, really. Could you put it around the moon? Mm -hmm. Would that still work? Well, it, they'd have to transport all the materials up to the moon. Yeah, no, but as far as in theory, with the lower gravity and everything. Yeah, yeah. You could, you could do it in theory if we had unlimited money. Mm -hmm. Maybe Elon Musk will fund it. No, I'm just saying, it's probably cheaper to put it around the moon than to bear with the earth. Yeah. People yeah. want people to ride on it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, the collider ride. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so there are theories in fundamental physics which are essentially untestable today because we don't have the money to build, you know, the, the equipment needed to test them. So that, that's, that is a good point. That's why particle physics has really been in a quagmire like for the last uh, few decades. Mm. So it hasn't really made progress since since I was in graduate school, and that's a long time ago. <laughs> well, I grew up in the outskirts of DC, and it was kind of interesting to see. I guess I'd not really heard of GW. I guess I would have never considered that like a powerhouse of physics research. It, is that kind of like a singularity or? Well, that, so what happened was when Gamov got the job there, um, he made some conditions for the job. One is he said, you need to hire another faculty member to work with me. And that turned out to be Edward Teller, very famous physicist. And then he said, I'd like to set up something like um, Niels Bohr's Institute with um, annual conferences. So he set up something called the Washington Conference and those became very popular and attracted people from all over the world. Mm. So that gave uh, George Washington University clout in the 1930s and 1940s. I'm not sure how good its physics department is today, but okay. in the 1930s and 1940s with, with Gamov and Teller there and with these major conferences, it was considered a really big, uh, important place. And in fact, that's where at one of those conferences, Niels Bohr announced that the Germans had uh, perfected nuclear fission, which set off, eventually set off the Manhattan Project. Oh, cool. Okay. Any questions from virtual land? From the virtual people. Yeah, about what age were these men when they got their breakthroughs? Well, question, they had uh, breakthroughs, a number of breakthroughs. Right. But Gamov, was in his 20s when he had his first breakthrough, which was breakthroughs, which was nuclear physics. But then when he developed uh, Big Bang nuclear synthesis, he was he was around 40. Um, okay. So and then he went on to uh, do some work in genetics. <laughs> he developed the idea that that RNA um, could the idea of the uh, that combinations of um, different, what they're called, nucleotides, I guess, um, in pairs, in groups of three, could create the amino, amino acids. I mean, he, he came up with that idea by taking a deck of cards and seeing how many ways he could arrange, like a you know, set of cards. And he contacted James Watson and, of Watson and Crick and worked on um, genetics for a while. It's a remarkable yeah. person. So, but but they had breakthroughs at different points in their life, and then Hoyle's major breakthroughs were really when he was in his thirties, and which was in the nineteen forties. So when he invented the deck of cards. Pardon? So when he invented the card deck, the Hoyle. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Ironically, with that's a good one. Yeah. Ironically, it was Gamma who. 
and had the deck of cards. Oh, was it really? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, that would be hilarious pictures. Yeah, but yeah, there's I don't know who the Hoyle was who uh, developed the books on books on playing cards, but <laughs> different Hoyle. I think. <laughs> oh, by the way, speaking of Hoyles, his granddaughter, um, Nicola Hoyle, I found out when it, she was very smart, she got a P PhD in math and engineering and developed a lot of the uh, CGI technology for the Harry Potter movies oh, really? yeah. for, um, for some of the other movies. Um, to make you feel old, they're 20 years old this month. Yeah, yeah. The very first Harry Potter oh, yeah, movie yeah, I saw that. 20 years ago. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, That's cool. But, uh, that is cool. Any other questions? What's the next book? Yeah. Um, we're <laughs> working on some articles now. Okay. I have some ideas, but I usually yeah. I like to keep you new, book, new book ideas under my vest until yeah um, until they're like available and developed. Are you all? I mean, I, I take it you're all. You've always got something that's cooking in terms of books. Yeah, I always sort of have ideas. Yeah, um, I keep an ideas file and you know talk to people. And my my publisher is definitely interested in <coughs> keeping me on. Um, <laughs> you know because it, with this book, this book got a lot of recognition from. Uh, you know, as I said, from reviewers and so forth, New York Times, and then I was on some, uh, you know, some big um, podcasts and so forth. And now it's going to be Science Friday, so they they like the recognition. Mm -hmm. awesome. Cool. So, Good. so I'm happy Fantastic. about that. Your act might be a book, but it's probably been pretty short. No, there actually is a really good biography of Durant. Oh, is it? Oh. Yeah, by Graham Formello. Oh, okay. So that's actually, uh, I would highly recommend that. It's called The Strangest Man. But yeah, Dirac was very, as you said, he was very soft spoken and um, was, had a sort of a strange way of speaking. Uh, but Hoyle, Hoyle and Gamma both interacted with Dirac at different times. Um, Dirac, uh, um, they had a strange relationship to Dirac and Gamma because uh, Dirac was very quiet, but he appreciated Gamma's sense of humor and appreciation of culture. And uh, one time when Gamma first moved to GWU, um, Hoyle was in Florida. He liked the state of Florida, he ended up there. And uh, he decided to send Gamma a present and he sent him a baby alligator <laughs> in an unmarked box. So they didn't know who it was from. And finally, he confessed to it. Which is yeah. a, <laughs> so they didn't know what to do with it. They just put it in their bathtub and <coughs> released it to the wild, destroyed the local ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Any other questions? Otherwise, again, thanks for Thank all you. Thank you. Thank you. Call will be available to uh, chat, sign books, sell books, whatever. Yeah. Glenn, did you say you had something? I brought some COVID ideas that I put together that I wanted to share as kind of like a show and tell if people would want to look at them. Is this like a stand in front or more I can, just yeah, a I casual? Can, I can stand How much time do you want? want? Get in front uh, of the camera. Five minutes. Yeah, go for it. See if and, you can show it to the camera. Well, here, and this one here. Okay. Yeah. And you, you know, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, I don't okay. need to get in there. Yeah. <laughs> See, where, where's my look back to there? Oh, there's me. Okay. Hi. Hello, everybody out there in the internet world. Uh, I am I am your shifty uh, appearance with a bag of unknown things. Um, so I want you to introduce yourself real quick. Yeah. My, name, my name is uh, Glenn Bach. Um, I work at Goddard Space Flight Center now. Um, and as a young man, I actually worked here. Uh, as a hobbyist uh, with the Minor Planet Group. Um, and I think we even worked on, uh, I, I might have helped a little bit on pushing the mirror when we polished the 24 uh, inch back in the day. Um, and then I went off and had a light and uh, started working at Goddard Space Flight Center building spacecraft. Um, over, over the uh, COVID, um, I spent most of my time at home. In fact, this is the largest group of people that I've been in a sealed, a closed building with in almost two years. Um, so, so hey, how's it going? Yeah. Um, this is an idea that I came up with where, you know, you're out under the stars and you're looking at M57 and you're looking at, you know, M13 and you're wondering where the heck are these things in three-dimensional space? 
This is a simple model of the Milky Way. That's the center of the Milky Way. Eventually, I'm going to draw a little arcs on this so that looks like spiral arms. This is a little representation of the solar system with the plane of the planets tilted at about 60 degrees, shows the direction of rotation. And it lets you show that M13 is over here, M15 is over here, M57 is over here. And if this hasn't put everybody to sleep at the star party, you can actually, I've actually put on one of the sides here, a little ruler, which shows you how much above and below each one of these things it is. And I've, I've got a little bead that's on a string that you can hold and say, okay, M13 is above the plane, below the plane. So my idea is to put a little model of a moon on the back. This is simply a uh, reflector for your front windshield. Uh, it's about $17 and it pops out. And that was the thing that I did. And this is a bead and a really big button that I just happened to find. I'll never know what that came from. Yeah, so that was that was one of the things that I came up with there. Uh, another thing that I ran into, I was invited up to central Pennsylvania um, before COVID to do sky shows. Um, up there, there's a dark site that's not too far away uh, from the middle of Pennsylvania. And one of the ideas that I've always had problems with is, you know, you're looking through the telescope and you're trying to explain to people, look at that crater on the moon. Look at that crater on the moon. Look at that ridge on the moon. That's almost impossible, right? Because you can't really stand there with a picture of the moon because usually that picture of the moon is a little too accurate and you can't really see it. So this was my solution. I drew a very stylized picture of the moon, which is upside down, okay? So you've got the major things that you can see with the naked eye. This is a shower curtain, $17. You can put anything on a shower curtain on Amazon. I hang this on either a, uh, like a, a set of legs that I bring with me that I found for like a shade out in the field, or I hang it over the edge of a uh, nearby fence. You can put it uh, like 100 yards away. When COVID, I put it 100 yards away and I fired a laser at it to point at the things and say, this dark thing over here is Mari Christian. Can you see that with the naked eye? Because nobody, nobody wanted to share telescopes in the early COVID. So this was a method that I used to actually point things out. You can download this picture if you want, make your own of these. It's all online. Um, so that was, that was an idea. And this last little idea that I came up with was another COVID sky show thing. This is a slow motion control altitude azimuth device. You can buy this for, I believe it's about 25 bucks on Amazon. It takes a while to find this. And what you can do is you can just attach this to the top of a regular tripod. You have to use the, the tilt part of the tripod to move this thing enough to like make it make sense. And then the um, azimuth as well to just kind of get in the general direction. But then you can use the slow motions and dial a green laser exactly on a Messier object. And you just, you know, you, you, you dial it in and you just hold the button for a little bit and say, okay, everybody get your binoculars because we're 20 feet away from each other. Get your binoculars, get your telescopes out if you brought one. Turn on the laser. Everybody follows that green laser up until it vanishes. And then say, okay, hold that position. You turn the laser off and everybody's looking at the same object. So this is a, another little thing where usually you can get the lasers, the uh, really the really bright ones that you never want to fire at an aircraft, by the way. Um, yeah, you can, you can damage your eye. This one melts chocolate. Um, but you can, the brackets usually come with them and you can just attach that in there. And the way that I use this was I sat in a chair on the top of a hill and people were down below me on, um, on picnic blankets, kind of spread out. Some had telescopes, some didn't have telescopes. And I just use this as a, take a look at this star, take a look at this object, take a look at this thing. And to tie in with that, um, I created a, for every visible star in the sky and many of the objects that we see in the SV object and when you see objects, I created a series of PDF files where every year I update them so that when you go outside on a given night and you look at say the bright stars in the summer triangle, you can actually, um, I could tell you what was happening when the light left that star, you know, kind of close. 
So I can say, okay, when the light left that star, you know, the letter zero was outlawed in Europe. You know, when that light left that star over there, you know, George Gamow was doing X and Y. And for every one of the objects out there, you have a long list of things. So you can usually go down and pare it down to something that might be interested to, you know, some people in the, uh, the audience. Is there musical stuff? There's a bunch of musical stuff in there, but you can download all that stuff too. So there you go. That's that's some that's some stuff that kept me. But you don't mind this going up on our YouTube no, channel? No, not a bit. Awesome. And if you want all, all of this stuff I've got on a website that I put together, uh, the spelling is horrible and the grammar is even more atrocious, but I'll give you that yeah. if you want to post it to Sounds cool. All this stuff you can download the diagrams and everything like that. Take care. The beans. I guess just give us one more second. Um, we got one last little bit and then uh, there are refreshments. I will get this. One more thing. All right, one last item, guys. Uh, on a sadder note, sorry to inform everybody, but Tom Harding passed away just recently. We were very sad to hear about that. Uh, he was a very regular attendee at our Zoom sessions during the pandemic. He was an excellent member of our DS board, board member at large for the last few years. He contributed quite a lot to our project, work on these pods and the Samhain and getting it all up and running. Uh, he's been a great member of the club. He ran a couple of workshops that I participated in uh, with the lathe in the workshop. So he taught me all about how to use a lathe and now I have a lathe. So it was really beneficial for me. So I really appreciated what he did for me and for the club. Unfortunately, he passed away recently. Did anyone else want to say a few words about Tom? Tom. Here, let me turn it to you. Tom, Tom was a, he, he was voted amateur Tom of the year a few years ago. I've known Tom for over 25 years. And I worked with him at the DuPont Experimental Station. We were great friends. Tom was always willing to help anybody. He loved to build stuff, especially machine stuff. So if you had a project, he was willing to jump in. I know a couple of months ago, I, I got a telescope that I've been looking for for many, many years and a part on it was broken. And Tom met me up here on a Saturday. He was still pretty weak at the time, but he was able to help me machine some parts. That's who Tom was. Uh, you know, he, uh, we thought we were gonna, he thought, we really thought that he was gonna beat his leukemia. And he had a, uh, he had a transplant and I think was looking good, but he kept getting these blood uh, infections. And unfortunately, I think that's what uh, was his demise. Uh, he left us way too uh, soon. He was only 69 years old and he'd only been retired for five years from the DuPont ex Experimental Station. So, yeah, I will miss my friend a lot. He was an amazing guy, just an amazing physicist. Like I said, I never saw Tom angry in the whole time that I've worked with him or knew him as a friend. Uh, besides being in, in amateur astronomy, he was an avid fisherman. Uh, he also was a member, a board member of the Rough and Tumble. Engineer Society up in uh, up in Pennsylvania. There, he uh, helped with those shows that they had a number of times a year. He built uh, model steam engines. Uh, he just became an amateur radio uh, ham operator. He got me into that too. So, uh, like I said, it's uh, real sad, and I don't miss my friend. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing, uh, Dave. So in just a couple more minutes, we'll be heading over into the other room to get some refreshments. Uh, those of you who are at home can, of course, get your refreshments at home. Uh, whatever's in your refrigerator, you know, You're enjoy it. <laughs> You're welcome to have whatever you like there. Uh, we have a number of things that Dan has laid out for us, and anyone here can partake in that. And I hope everybody has a good month, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.